For those of you that aren't familiar with Ryan Conrad's work, um, he is part of the Against Equality Collective, um, and he's going to be covering three different um, topics today. Um, it's largely a critique of the mainstream gay rights movement in this country, um, and uh, the sort of like three pillars um, that that uh, comprise it. Um, those those being marriage, uh, hate crimes legislation. And what was the third one? Military. Military, thank you. Um, so we're very excited to have him here. Uh, he came all the way from Montreal to speak to us here today. Um, I don't really have anything prepared to, uh, to introduce him beyond that, so if we could just give a round of applause for... trying to get out to this part of uh, New York for a couple years now, and it was really nice to be able to get here through um, something I'll talk a little bit more about in uh, my discussion, um, but exploiting private colleges and getting them to give you lots of money so that you can fund travel to other places. Um, so thank you, Vassar College, um, for uh, putting the bill. Um, and through them, we were able to do an event in Buffalo yesterday and Rochester today. Um, and doing the events in smaller places is really important to me. Uh, I'm from Central Maine. Has anyone here been to Maine before? Two people, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> cool, you probably haven't been to my town, it's really small. Um, but I'm from a sort of post-industrial mill town um, that uh, was textiles and shoes, and now it's call centers and hospitals. Um, so it, feels familiar to be in places like Rochester and Buffalo, even though you're actually way bigger than where I'm from. <laughs> even though you probably think this is a small city, it's like five times the size of where the town I'm from. Uh, and I live in the second largest town in the state of Maine. <laughs> so uh, it tells you a little bit about size, but it's, it's really exciting to be here and be in a place where uh, people are interested and want to have conversations uh, about the stuff we're going to talk about tonight. Because um, I do this all over the world. I just got back from Australia and New Zealand for two months, um, and now I'm in Rochester. So hey, that's awesome. Uh, I do this kind of stuff in New York and San Francisco, and like five people come, and they're all just like over it, right? Because it's like there's a million queer LGBT things that happen there, and they just like are over it and don't care. Um, so it's nice to be here where there's more people than show up in San Francisco. So you're cooler than San Francisco. <laughs> um, if you didn't already know that. Um, so I've got a bit of a PowerPoint today uh, because I like to offer visuals for sort of grounding the conversation because I think it helps uh, move the dialogue along. Um, so you'll see me sort of trying to do this while also talk to you and also try to somewhat stick to a script, but I'm not gonna uh, stay tight to the script tonight. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'm gonna give you um, sort of an overview of what the Against Equality Collective is and how it started. Uh, and then we're gonna explore in depth, uh, like Jake says, the sort of three themes that we focus on, uh, being marriage, military, and hate crimes legislation. Uh, and how that's gonna happen because of the collective that I'm a part of is actually uh, a group of five people, and I'm only one person here in front of you. Uh, I have two videos uh, from collective members, Karma, uh, Yasmin Nair and Karma Chavez. Uh, and so also important to bring the voices of queer women of color into the room since they actually make up a majority of the collective. Um, so you'll be hearing from Yasmin speaking about gay marriage and Karma Chavez talking about uh, LGBT military inclusion and what those things mean. And then I'm gonna focus more particularly on hate crimes legislation and the prison <coughs> complex as that relates to queer, trans, and gender nonconforming people. And then we should have a conversation, because um, I'll talk a lot, and then I want to listen uh, and hear other people uh, talking about things that are happening here, uh, and things that people are excited about, uh, or answer questions if people have questions. Um, but for me, one of the most exciting things about being able to tour and travel and talk to other people um, is learning about local struggles and how people are organizing locally. Um, and it's been really awesome to meet uh, some folks in Buffalo yesterday that uh, work with Black and Pink, which is a prison prisoner LGBT prisoner pen pal project and resource project, um, and also of course meeting uh, lots of people 
uh, from who are queer and in the labor movement, uh, particularly working around the Fight for 15 stuff. That's super exciting. I'm really excited to tell people back home about that stuff. Um, so we'll, we'll try to open it up and make it not about me and not about against equality, but about what's happening here, because um, that's more exciting to me. <laughs> Um, so, does that sound good for a uh, sort of trajectory for the evening? Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, okay. So, Against Equality, uh, as it exists today, um, is an all-volunteer anti-capitalist collective, <coughs> and we're based uh, partly, uh, I'm in, in Montreal now, but we're mixed between North uh, uh, Canada and the United States, so we're sort of spread across North America. Uh, one person's in Chicago, one person's in Madison, Wisconsin, and two people are in Washington, D.C. Again, as you'll note, no one's in New York, no one's in San Francisco, which are, of course, right, the places where everyone thinks gay and lesbian politics happen. Well, it's not true. Um, there are people in other parts of the world doing interesting things, including us. Um, so I think that's important to point out. Because um, a lot of times people think we're part of this like gay elite um, that come out of like these super liberal <coughs> places. Uh, and Yasmin lives in Chicago, which is probably the most liberal of all the places, and then there's like rural Wisconsin, rural Maine, uh, and people in DC, uh, which is a mixed bag. Um, so important to point out that like a radical queer politic can come out of all sorts of different places, and that we all don't need to like move to New York or move to San Francisco to be able to do uh, important and interesting work. Uh, and so as a collective, wh what we do is we um, archive uh, critiques of what we call the holy trinity of gay and lesbian politics which again are coming back to marriage, uh, militarism, and prison expansion via hate crimes legislation. Uh, and so how this project started was in 2009, uh, for folks that don't know, there was a gay marriage referendum in the state of Maine uh, where gay marriage was passed legislatively. And then we have this kind of interesting legislative strategy in the state called the People's Veto. And so if you collect 60,000 signatures, you can actually put any law that's passed by the, the state legislator and put it to a referendum. Um, so this is what happened in 2009. And essentially what the state equality organization did, who were getting millions of dollars from the human rights campaign and from the National Gay and Lesbian <coughs> Task Force, what they did was a get out the vote campaign in Portland, Maine. Um, so Portland is the major city. It's where all the liberal people live. It's where all the wealth is in the state. Uh, which essentially led to a massively homophobic backlash in the rest of the state with no resources and no funding to combat that homophobia that was being uh, conjured up against gay marriage. Um, so me working at the only LGBT youth drop-in in the state left after the, the last, there used to be eight outrights in the state and all of them have closed except for the one in my hometown. It's because it's run by welfare moms who actually just volunteer all their time and make sure that it survived. <coughs> Whereas all the other ones have turned to like sort of a professionalized nonprofit model of paid staff and they have all closed. Um, and so it left us to sort of clean up the mess um, that was, uh, you know, homophobic vitriol on like a grand scale, a massive scale. Uh, and so we had to clean up the mess. And a lot of us were really pissed off about the sort of urban centrism of this campaign and the total lack of a vision for long-term cultural change and a focus on short-term legislative change, right? Um, and so that's how this project actually started was me in Maine really pissed off. Um, and so what do people do when they're pissed off in 2000s? You start Tumblr. <laughs> um, so uh, this is actually the first image uh, on my blog um, in this queer collective house I used to live in, in Lewiston. Um, yeah, these signs right, are, are everywhere. Um, and so yeah, I started this website as sort of a, a you know, I made this logo, which is like an, a greater than sign mathematically instead of the yellow equal sign. I was like, fuck you, I don't want to be equal. Like, we're all better than that. Like, we don't need to like lower our standards to like heteropatriarchy. We're better than that. There's something greater than that. Uh, and so I made this logo. I like published a piece I'd written about how I thought it was really fucked up what happened in Maine. Uh, and then they lost, also, P.S. So if marriage got voted down after they did a really shitty campaign. Um, and so I posted this, this, this work on my blog, and then the blog uh, quickly became, uh, it got a lot of attention. People started sending me, thank you for writing this. Check out this thing I wrote about um, the gay marriage movement in my state, or check out this thing I wrote 
or have you uh, thought about how the mil like the demand for inclusion in military is like a similar kind of logic of demand for inclusion as opposed to like you know how do we transform or actually change these things at the root uh, as opposed to like just joining them as they are um, so the website went from this personal project to being rearticulated as a collective project between myself uh, and Yasmin Nair. And then uh, over the years, we've added uh, <coughs> other collective members. So there's now five of us. Um, again, uh, the, the, the project as it exists now is this website, which uh, if you go to so here, there's a, a drop-down button that says themes. If you click on that, it drops down, and you have marriage, military, and prisons. Within that, there's a bunch of links to articles, visual work, and performance work um, of people who have a critique of those institutions. Um, Against Equality itself is not an organization. Um, it's really important because people think we're some sort of like, whenever we get press, we're referred to as this movement or an organization, and what we really are is just an archive. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's nice that people think we actually do all this stuff in the world, but at the core, we're just an archive. Um, we don't have an office, we don't have a phone number, uh, we don't have an internship volunteer coordinator. Like None of these things actually exist within our project. We are strictly an archive. Um, and out of that archive, um, we uh, have done lots of really interesting work. Uh, sort of contrary to us is the sort of uh, Nonprofit model uh, that is employed by um, mega wealthy organizations like the Human Rights Campaign and the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. For folks that don't know, the Gay and Lesbian Task Force has recently changed their name to the Task Force um, in their attempt to be more inclusive. Uh, but I think it's really useful to be thinking about how much money flows through these sort of structures and how these structures are actually uh, uh, tax havens for wealthy people. Um, and that's how nonprofits are, are actually functioning in, in many ways in our, our communities. Um, but to point out that right, the CEO of HRC uh, basically makes half a million dollars a year. Um, so I don't understand how anyone could think that some asshole that makes half a million dollars a year has any connection to the people, whatever that means, right? Um, it's really ridiculous to think that this, this person in this organization and their model of organizing is relevant to most of our lives, right? Um, so Against Equality uh, functions as anti-profit, not simply non-profit, because we actually think the non-profit structures are, are quite problematic uh, or troublesome. And um, a, lot, a lot of this critique is informed by women of color anti-violence projects that have sort of developed this critique of the non-profit industrial complex, um, particularly uh, the group Insight, who uh, has a book called the, the Revolution Will Not Be Funded, which for people who are interested in this kind of critique, that's another another place to look for that. Um, so uh, being anti-profit, not non-profit, means like we don't do grants, we don't do board development, we don't do uh, any sort of that stuff that's associated with, um, with non-profits. And that has actually allowed us to stay more accountable to each other, to be accountable to our communities that we actually live in. Um, and uh, it also means like uh, struggling a bit financially. Um, because we try to make the work that we do and produce a, a, a very, um, available uh, economically to people. So to activate the work that's in our archive, we've done publishing projects where we actually publish things that were published online in print, right? So that people can have access to them in print. And part of that project has been to make sure that we don't leave people who are incarcerated out of the loop, right? So all these things that are in our archive are digitally published things, but the people in prison do not have access to those things because there's no internet like computer terminal in a prison. Um, and so that's been really important to us. So we actually uh, provide all our publications for free to prisoners and do uh, announcements through different LGBT prisoner newsletters. Uh, and so what we've done is we, we've partnered with LGBT Books to Prisoners in Madison, Wisconsin, um, and we've sent them over 300 books uh, over the last year. And um, any time that we get a check for royalties for this book being sold, we use that money to pay for more books to go to LGBT Books to Prisoners and we just send them hundreds of dollars to cover the shipping uh, and packaging costs. Um, so for anyone that thinks we make money off this project, ha, huh, that's a joke. <laughs> no one makes money publishing books. Um, and secondly, we use anything that we do get to make sure that we um, don't leave incarcerated LGBTQ people out of um, these sort of political conversations. Um, 
Another important piece to this project um, being that we're an archival project. So for folks that don't know, the Defense of Marriage Act has been overturned pretty much. Don't Ask, Don't Tell has um, uh, been repealed. Uh, and federal hate crimes legislation has been passed. So as a project, we seem like a moot point <laughs> to some people, right? Like, why are you still doing this? Um, and I think what we're doing is actually quite important because there's an active erasure by mainstream gay lesbian organizations to provide a linear progress narrative of like, right, everyone wanted this, and that's why we spent all this money and resources and time on it. Uh, when in reality, I think there's a lot of people uh, who are quite uh, skeptical and critical of the engagement of the mainstream LGBT movement with these uh, three sites of inclusion. Um, so yeah, I would say that it's, it's more important today than ever before having these three things uh, um, uh, passed in the world. And so we like to see the pieces in our archive uh, almost like breadcrumbs, right? Leading to different historical pathways to people thinking about what justice could and should look like. Uh, as opposed to uh, uh, settling for some uh, veiled pragmatic solution, right? That it's easier to be included than to transform, and we say no, that's like actually a really narrow vision for what the world could look like. Um, and we also think of it, right, we're, we're keeping these histories alive, much like we look to other historical groups. Um, and these are just a, a handful of examples from Queer Nation, Vanguard, Queer to the Left, and Gay Liberation Front. Um, as sort of groups that we look to. So we hope that we can, through these archival and publishing projects, provide um, those small little links to this historical narrative, right? Because we're not isolated, we're not doing this out of nowhere. There's a historical uh, record of people um, doing this kind of resistance movement and, and we want to situate ourselves in that. Um, the last thing I'm going to focus on um, is just the publishing projects that we've done before I get to the, to the video. Um, so we self-published the first three books, uh, one after another. They're, they're pocket-sized, they're cute, they look really good, sticking out of your back pocket. Um, they're apparently eBay gold these days, um, because they're out of print, someone's been selling them for like thousands of dollars on the internet. Um, please do not buy them, uh, because all three are reprinted in the new book, um, so you get all the same stuff, you just don't have to pay thousands of dollars. Um, so uh, important things to think about in terms of this publishing process um, is that again, everything that's in these books is available for free online. So people often say like, well, why would you print this stuff? Um, one, uh, again, coming back to the issue of LGBTQ prisoners, wanting to make sure that they have access to these conversations that are happening online. Um, two, uh, there's lots of uh, folks that actually don't engage with the internet in the same way many younger people do. I'm not trying to create stereotypes about older folks, but I know that my parents actually can't use a computer very well, so how do I expect them to be able to engage in this kind of work um, when uh, it's not readily available to them uh, in the way that it might be to others? Um, thirdly, uh, and folks maybe in New York, upstate New York might know this uh, for communities here, but uh, the fire, you, you can't get high-speed internet in most of the communities north and west of where I'm from because the fiber optic cables don't exist. Like, they're, they're literally not there, so you couldn't buy it if you wanted it. Uh, and the reason for this is because it's not profitable to telecommunication companies to put those up, So because there's so few customers that they wouldn't make their money back, right? Um, and supposedly there's money through the stimulus bill that got passed by Obama years ago to actually try to close the technology gap. I have yet to see that actually do anything. Um, I'm sure telecommunication companies just pocketed that money. Um, if they even sell the money at all. Um, so thinking about right people who don't actually have ready in internet access, or if they do their primary re uh, resources for internet access are schools or public libraries. And in those places we have really terrible software like NetNanny uh, and Barracuda and other things that block any website with any content that relates to gay and lesbian because it's obviously porn. Um, so <laughs> all those things are blocked. I worked at a, at a mental health clinic uh, which also utilizes this, this sort of um, terrible, terrible homophobic and transphobic software um, that blocked all the LGBT suicide prevention organizations like the Trevor Project, which is like the most banally liberal project in the world, um, but it was considered pornography by this net nanny software, right? So we have to be thinking about people whose accesses are limited 
Um, and I think it's difficult for a lot of city folk to actually conceptualize that someone might not have access to the internet, but it's true, um, it's reality. And there's also, one last thing I'll say is there's, there's been recent studies about um, poverty and race and the way that people access the internet. Um, and for poor and racialized people, the primary means of accessing the internet is on your mobile device. And I don't see the, I would be interested to, to think about how people who primarily access the internet through a mobile device probably don't read five to 6,000 word pieces on their mobile device. Like it's just, I don't think that's a reality. I know I don't. Um, and I, I would imagine a lot of other people don't. So again, thinking about how people engage the internet is a really um, important thing to think about, um, particularly outside of urban centers. Um, so this is something we think about. The last thing I'll say about printing before <coughs> I get to Yasmin's video, um, how many people have written papers or articles and have cited a blog before, like a blog post? A handful. Is there any of this in school? Did teachers get mad? Okay. Most teachers do not like when you cite personal blogs um, as opposed to peer reviewed journals or things like that where you know official knowledge is created in certain ways through academic channels. Um, and we think this is fucked up um, because it sort of puts a, um, a limit on what can count as official knowledge. Um, so we just scam a bunch of credit cards. We put some fake address for the publisher. The publisher, not AE Press isn't a thing. It has like an address of an old house I lived at. And we print some books. Um, and suddenly the sort of more personalist political work that appears on the internet is now in print. And it suddenly it's official knowledge and teachers teach this work in schools so because it's in a book, right? So now that you can cite it because it has a publisher and it's in print. Um, so I think this is really important in thinking about who gets to create knowledge or what counts as actual knowledge. Um, and a lot of us in the collective have either have degrees or work in academia, and so we're all s very self-critical and critical of this sort of process and thinking about how Against Equality has sort of like tried to circumvent that process and say fuck you to you know, these academic publishers who take six years to publish a book when it's like then not relevant. Um, and peer edited by people who know nothing about the topic that you're talking about and have conservative politics. Um, so we took it upon ourselves to scam a bunch of credit cards and print them ourselves. Um, and it worked for us. And the way that we paid off all our debt is you go speak at fancy private colleges and you charge them lots of money. Um, again, that's how I'm here. Uh, and so that's all I'll say about the collective itself. If people have questions about more about the collective and how it functions, um, I don't mind answering those questions at the end. Um, but now I want to move to the videos just so you hear other people's voices besides mine. Um, so again, this is going to be Yasmin Nair, uh, and she's going to be talking about, uh, in particular, she's going to focus on the Edith Windsor case. How many people here are familiar with the Edith Windsor case? A couple, handful? OK, great. So this will provide um, a basic overview of the case and a critique of it, because it is the case that um, overturned most of the regulations in, in the Defense of Marriage Act. So it's a useful thing to be thinking about. My talk today will, in essence, connect the dots between the rise of neoliberalism in the US and the rise of gay marriage. I define neoliberalism as the intense privatization of everyday life and the formation of a state which increasingly places the burden of care upon the family as a unit as opposed to the state. I will be situating gay marriage within an economic context with particular emphasis on Edith Windsor, the plaintiff at the heart of the recent DOMA or Defense of Marriage Act. The problem with gay marriage is not that it compels people to engage in forms of assimilation or that it cuts short their sex lives, or that it makes them less interesting. The problem with gay marriage in the United States is that it is part of the machinery of neoliberalism, and that it functions both to effectively end the state's interest in maintaining the well-being of people, and to increase the economic power of a wealthy elite. So first, as I'll indicate in a little while, if we are to combat neoliberalism, we need to combat the institutions that enable it and make it stronger. In the US, unlike countries like Canada and Sweden, marriage is all that can guarantee a myriad of life-saving benefits, including health care and immigration status. 
So when I am against equality, or when against equality declares itself against equality and calls for an end to marriage, what we are doing is to insist that there is simply no beyond marriage. We have to dismantle the structure which builds marriage into essential benefits. Liberals, progressives, and most leftists praise gay marriage, or what they call marriage equality, as a mark of civilized progress, while they simultaneously scratch their heads trying to understand how and why this country is moving so inexorably and so brutally towards an intensely privatized state, where the most basic needs of people, housing, food, healthcare, and education, are simply not being met. So the question then remains, how did liberals and leftists alike, who are otherwise constantly calling for a change in the economic structure of the US, fail to see that gay marriage is a part of neoliberalism? I now turn to Edith Windsor at the heart of the DOMA Defense of Marriage Act case. Edith Windsor, who was not legally, was not legally married to her longtime partner upon the latter's death, and was left consequently with a large estate tax amounting to over $363,000. Now, it's very important to remember that the issue was not ever that Edith Windsor was, in, was unable to pay that amount because of, say, poverty. It is not that she was incapable financially of paying over $363,000. It is that she felt it was unfair that she should have to pay that amount. I want now to switch a little bit and talk about a brief piece of, a mem piece of memorabilia, a memento. A moment from Chicago's Pride celebration this past summer, uh, right after the Doma win. A friend sent me a photo of a t-shirt that someone, that apparently many people were wearing, um, which reminded me of the ways in which gay marriage serves to occlude and obfuscate the ways in which it is wrapped up in neoliberalism. The t-shirt in question featured Windsor's smiling face and the words, I am Edith Windsor. In other words, there are no people marching everywhere, or marching and celebrating Pride, but also just walking around, comfortable in the idea that they're all somehow Edith Windsor. This particular phrase, of course, is not to be taken literally, but it does speak to a, a general and pervasive idea in the gay community that Windsor represents a grassroots impulse towards marriage, and that she is, in fact, every woman. It's important in the context of understanding gay marriage as a manifestation of neoliberalism to trace Windsor's actual history. The story of how she came to be at the center of what will no doubt become one of the most famous legal cases of in LGBT history has a lot to do with how the gay movement strategically chose Windsor, having carefully picked her out of a bevy of possible cases. As we now know, Windsor was chosen as a perfect candidate. We know all of this, incidentally, from the press coverage that was present a little before, but not much. But now there have been reviews, or rather there have been profiles in The Guardian and The New Yorker and so on, which give us all these details. She was chosen as a perfect candidate, a grieving and very presentable widow, with nothing explosive in her past life, with exemplary social networks and connections. And for this, of course, as I said, we have mounting evidence that this was a deliberately, strategically planned move. It's important to note that until some weeks after the actual decision, Windsor's actual financial situation was almost never discussed. And she was often, in fact, implicitly and sometimes explicitly portrayed as a little, as a stereotypical little old lady, perhaps living somewhere in a darkened New York City apartment barely able to keep her lights on as they flickered in the face of poverty. All of this, of course, was most palatable for an average person. Over the course of the publicity leading to the case, lawyers for Windsor, the gay media, much of the liberal progressive straight media and gay marriage activists assiduously worked at keeping Windsor's actual life out of view. Even the New York Times, which otherwise takes so much pride in being able to reveal details about people's lives and providing comprehensive reports, never once discussed the actual value of Windsor's estate. The only publication to actually eventually, to even actually declare Windsor wealthy was, the, was Forbes magazine. Now I'm part of a group called Gender Just, and of course as well, 
against equality. <clears throat> what distinguishes both groups from many others is that we actually consider queerness as something that works within economic frameworks, not simply as a cultural or sexual identity. To that end, this summer, Gender Just began an ongoing research project which involves finding out the actual amounts of money that have been poured into marriage campaigns across this country. We are doing this because, as radical queer grassroots activists, many of us are involved in queer projects of various kinds, such as working with queers in the prison industrial complex, harm reduction programs around drug use, working with LGBTQ youth, engaged in street trade that might involve sex work and drugs, as well as the somewhat more, let, let us say, fashionable, well, more well-known issues of LGBTQ housing and healthcare. Those agencies and organizations that work on these matters that I just listed are often, not often, always, desperately scrambling for funds while marriage fundraisers raise literally, and I am not joking here, this is literally true, hundreds of thousands of dollars in single nights or in a few weeks. To put it bluntly, no one has ever seen a Kickstarter for a marriage campaign. Every marriage campaign ever launched in big and small cities and states has been well-funded by organizations like Human Rights Campaign and the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force and many others. What this means on the ground is that marriage, which pushes uh, a neoliberal agenda of privatization, is now at the forefront of, um, of this supposed battle for gay rights, and that it has, in fact, has effectively swallowed up resources that could and should actually go to other organizations. So, but the point of all of this is that the sum result of our investigation was that we discovered that, by even, that even Windsor, and I only will speak for myself at this point, um, uh, is in fact worth by a conservative estimate in the region of seven million dollars, which is to say very few people, and probably certainly not the people wearing that t-shirt, can actually be Edith Windsor. Now, in New York City, a worth, a worth of seven to 10 million may not ensure your place to the right of the billionaire ex-mayor of New York, Mayor B Michael Bloomberg, but I think we can agree that it takes you quite far in most parts of the world. I emphasize this matter of Windsor's financial worth because she represents the ways in which the gay marriage fight has been understood and regurgitated as a grassroots struggle engaged upon by millions of lovelorn gays and lesbians, when in fact, as our research shows of against equality and gender just, it is a massively well-coordinated campaign which has cost, again, overall, not just um, and in terms of the larger campaign across about the last five to seven years, a few hundred million dollars altogether. That's how much that campaign has been costing us so far. You might ask, why does all of this matter? It matters because many of the central tenets on which gay marriage is being built as a movement towards equality are in fact benefits which only accrue to the wealthy few like Edith Windsor. So one of the biggest arguments around Windsor versus Doma was that this would affect, uh, positively affect, all those gays and lesbians faced with estate taxes. But in fact, very few of them will ever have to owe those kinds of estate taxes. That's one. Two, is that if you have that kind of an estate, you really should, in the interest of fairness to all, be paying a certain percentage of your estate uh, of, of taxes. And it's things like estate taxes, after all, which also fund things like public school systems. Now, this is, of course, this sort of um, argument that all gays will benefit, whereas, in fact, only a few wealthy uh, gays will benefit, is also true, for instance, in the field of immigration, which is uh, uh, those who are in binational gay, uh, gay binational couples um, are also benefiting from DOMA because they can now sponsor their, um, their partners for immigration. What that ignores again, while it pretends that this is somehow beneficial to all gays and lesbians who might have partners who are not um, US citizens, what this ignores is that you still have to have a certain economic uh, value in order to be able to sponsor your partner. 
they actually take very hard looks at your bank account. You have to have a certain level of income. Not only do you have to have a certain level of income, you have to guarantee that you will have that level of income for a certain number of years. Um, so, of course, and of course, if you happen, if your partner happens to be someone who had a minor infraction, a DUI, um, or worse, or was uh, or entered the country illegally, there's no hope for a spousal sponsorship, sponsorship at all. So, I'll leave the discussion about all of that for later. But let me conclude by saying that the many benefits, supposed benefits of gay marriage, simply as I've tried to show, are primarily benefits. That the wealthy enjoy. The average gay and lesbian person or the average per straight person for that matter is not likely to accrue an estate worth as much as that left to Edith Windsor. As it stands today, marriage in the US is a significant structural component of the neoliberal machinery of the state. In the end, to position the key problem with gay marriage as in essence somehow being only about one about people fucking differently, or horrors not at all, is to ignore the much more insidious and pervasive role that marriage plays in the neoliberal state. Woo!